another very acceptable approach would be to um, show off your sort of dazzling brushwork. Um, all of these approaches Watts rejected completely out of hand, and partly he rejected them because they were approaches, because they were systematic approaches, and what he wanted to do was to get people to um, aspire beyond whatever it was, whatever rut it was they were stuck in. And the subject matter here is one of someone seeking satisfaction. And for Watts, the most important thing that anyone could do as an artist or as a person was to be dissatisfied with whatever it was that you had. And in a, a work like this, what Watts is doing is being somewhat evocative, somewhat um, vague in creating an image which doesn't necessarily clearly make perfect sense and thereby sort of forcing you um, to go beyond it. And part of the ways he does that is by simply undercutting other artists um, in terms of style. Okay. Okay, this is, this painting is called For He Had Great Possessions, and this is a another biblical story. Um, this man asked Jesus uh, if he could follow him and be one of his disciples, and uh, Christ said, yeah, sure, you can come along, but what you have to do is give up all of your money, and the man wouldn't do it, and he turned away, for he had great possessions, so that's the, the title of his work. So it's a, a, a painting, again, along this theme of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. This is a man who has everything materially. All he has to do to go with, along with um, Jesus is give it up, and he won't do it. And not only won't he do it, but what he's doing has driven him into despair. And it's interesting sort of how Watts has approached it as a painter, and then the subject is sort of made his head and ear and back of the neck very unattractive. But if one of the things that people love about this painting is this handling of the drapery in the foreground, how, how really nice that sleeve is. How he's flashy, showing off, just the kind of thing that I said that he didn't do in his later paintings. Well, he did do it in this painting, and he did it because that those are the clothes of the materialist man, and he's using beauty in the painting as a way of running down um, this man. It's one of the rare cases in, in which uh, he gives in to sort of flashy sergeant style painting. He uses it sort of as an international sign for don't do it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, these are two good examples of paintings by Frederick Layton. He's a camp contemporary with Watson, um, president of the Royal Academy. This gives you an idea of the standard for sort of technical um, painting. Very, very attractive, beautiful works of these reclining, sleeping women, sort of uh, ideal of, of sumptuous luxury. And this is another painting by a major academic painter named Pointer of the same style. So you get some idea of how other artists at the same time were handling the nude and female subjects uh, in particular. Go back to that second one, please. This one is called Flaming June. And Frederick Layton was a very close friend of Watts. Okay. By Albert Moore, a little bit earlier, but basically the same period. Albert Moore uses the same sort of very attractive, reclining, sleeping uh, female figure. He was a friend of Whistler's, and um, even though it might seem strange, a work like this seemed a little too austere and cold at the time. He was an artist who was never admitted into the Royal Academy and was um, really had to sort of exist on his own. Um, but it, you'll see that this makes quite a contrast in, to what Watts was doing and that what Moore is doing was really more in line with academic painting than what Watts was doing. Okay. <clears throat> what it seems 
to me that Watts is doing in a painting like this is working along the same lines of the earlier models, the models in the Albert Moore and Frederick Layton, which were all over at the time. But what he's done is to give us a sleeping uh, female figure here, strangely enough with a, with a baby, which is absolutely anything but titillating, anything but pleasing, not at all attractive, and set it against um, a background which is at once sort of enigmatic and uh, disturbing. And what he was trying to do, um, possibly with works like this, is as much as anything is confuse you and to undermine what these other artists are doing and to sort of stimulate thought for things uh, beyond. He was extremely opposed to the idea of any sort of formularized um, approach to painting. And this appears to me to be a, a conscious attempt to sort of undo what some of his best friends were doing at this very time. It's another one of Watts's murky sort of confusing slightly messy, anatomically strange uh, paintings. The subject is Orpheus and Eurydice, and it's one that he painted um, earlier in his career, too. The one that came back um, was particularly impor important for him later. The story is simply that uh, Orpheus goes into hell to bring Eurydice back, and he can as long as he doesn't look back at her. And originally, when Watts painted it, it seemed to fit into the theme of sort of romantic frustration of no matter what happens to man, everything goes wrong all the time. But in his later works, it's just that sort of frustration that becomes the seat of value. It's really um, aspiring for the unattainable, almost more than anything that, that Watts, I think, is promoting in a work like this. That there's such a feeling of vitality and activity at the same moment that the very thing that he wants is being lost. And it's the kind of subject that I think that he was shooting for. Was in terms of style and in terms of subject matter, the, the very worst thing that can happen to you is to find satisfaction. Satisfaction for Watts is death. And the more frustrating and disappointing um, your life is, the better. And in every way, of theme, iconography, subject matter, and style, Watts tries to undercut everything that's going and tries to promote um, movement beyond and where you are. And this is in, it's sort of the virtue of suffering in everything. Uh, okay. Interesting one. This is one of Watts' last last paintings. It was painted in about 1902, and it was exhibited. Um, and one of the most striking things is that it has, seems to me, to have so little to do with what was going on in his own work stylistically and what was going on in other people's work stylistically. Highly abstract work. Susan and I have long debates as to whether the figure, if you can make it out, is walking forward or uh, away from us. Um, it's a painting of God. It's a painting which doesn't clearly make a lot of sense um, at all to begin with. And one of the striking themes for me with Watts in looking at his work as a whole is his belief that the things that make sense are the things that we make make sense. Um, what Watts tries to do in lots of his works is extol the virtue of all kinds of different societies and civilizations and how they approach their art and at the same time sort of undercut it all and give us works that are vague enough so that we as a viewer are forced to try to make sense of them because he believes that that is the way the world operates, that that's all that's ever been done. And one thing he's always trying to do is undercut the value of any particular scheme at any particular time. Um, and this sort of vagueness, which 
would be difficult to turn into um, a style and was contrary to the going styles at the time was for what's fundamental because vagueness is the nature of the universe out of which we make sense and he says things like that um, time and time again. Thank you. 